said that this morning, and I'm sure somebody went, huh? I'm, I'm getting to the point where I don't know how to pray. I'm learning so much. I don't even know how to say the stuff I need to say in prayer. I just go, oh, is that good? Is that bad? Is this, Lord, am I, where's my faith? Am I in covenant? Am I in, what am I, oh, Lord, God, it is radically affecting my life. Do you understand? Now, this morning, we're going to have some fun. And uh, doing it wrong or get her done. <laughs> got to do the get her done stuff. Getting it done. We got to do the get her done. We're doing this from, we're starting off always in Ephesians 2, 12. That at that time you were without Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And this whole little ditty there about strangers of the covenants of promise bothers me. Because the more I study, the more I realize, folks, we are just not knowledgeable about something that is of utmost importance. And this is why I'm, I'm taking my time. I'm trying to take my time. It sounds like I'm really rushing. But you've got to know what wealth of information I'm cutting these down from. I may only preach half this message this morning. I may only preach half of what I have prepared only because I don't want to rush it. And I don't want to miss when you do a... a, a there's two things I want to teach this morning. If I teach the first one and then I go and teach the second one and you forget the first one, we will have failed. You need to get them both. So we're going to be talking this morning about that and this is very important. Have I prayed yet? No. Where are my rock salt students keeping me in line? Okay, let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, this morning. I need your help, Lord. I, I know that this is important. This thing has all the earmarks, Lord, and it feels right in my gut as something of huge importance. And Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Lord, relax me. Keep me in exactly where you want me to be, Lord, and I will be there. Thank you. I need you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're still on the Abrahamic covenant, not the Abrahamic covenant. Because this is before the name change. His, sta- his name was still Abram. And we are talking, we've been talking about this covenant stuff. And listen, God kept initiating these covenants. It was God initiating them. He's the one that approached Noah. And Noah didn't go running around saying, God, where are you? I want to have a covenant with you. God found Noah. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the Lord came to Noah and said, okay, you are less corrupt than the entire rest of the world. Less corrupt. There was still corruption in his family. Do you understand? He was not perfect. We keep trying to think that the patriarchs were some kind of glow-in-the-dark somethings that were... No, they were real people with real problems. And Noah had his fair share. But you understand, this is hundreds of years before the law. What law was there? Very little law. Okay? But still, people had their conscience... You remember that. Where did they get that from? Adam, who ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He had knowledge of good and evil. Men knew what was good and what was evil. Something about raping people is evil. Without the law, it's still wrong. Something about killing people is still evil. Cain found that out. No law. You want to hear something very interesting? And we'll talk about this again. This is fascinating. Cain, where's your brother? (laughs) Am I my brother's keeper, which we'd love to quote? The answer was, yeah. (laughs) Are you your brother's keeper? Absolutely. You are to watch out for your brother. Absolutely. And he says, where's your brother? I don't know. It's your hour to keep watch on him, not mine. And God said something of great depth that will end up being a huge theme for us later. later. Trust me. And he says, your brother's blood cries out from the ground to me. Your brother's blood cries out from the ground. Do we understand the power of blood covenant yet? There was blood shed, and it was out of order, and it was something horrible and nasty, and God says that blood is crying out to me. Only animals were to be slain like that. Okay? I think that's pretty heavy. The Abrahamic covenant. 
Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 16. Now last week we talked about the splitting the parts of the animals and laying them out and walking the path of blood. Walking the path of blood. Jim, I've got a little bit of a ring going on up here. I, I feel like I'm in a cave. Now's not the time to experiment on the reverberation of the building, okay? <laughs> Jim was studying about microphones this week and he found out you can actually do that with a microphone and get the, the building's reverb, natural reverb itself, to do stuff and don't have to use it electronically. Kind of interesting, but not now. Amen. Now, last week we talked about how God told Abram, hey, walk, I am your shield. And because I'm your shield, your reward will increase greatly. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. He says, now, and he says, and then Abram said, ha, who says I, I have any inheritance when I don't even have an heir? And the heir of my house is a servant that was born in my house, Eliezer of Damascus. We have no idea how old Eliezer was. We have no idea about anything about him. We have no knowledge about him whatsoever. Eliezer of Damascus. Who's that? I don't know, but he just got ripped out of the inheritance because God says, nope, it's not going to be Eliezer. It's going to be someone of your own flesh. Now, what did Abram hear from that? My own flesh? Now, he was believing God for something. He says of your seed. In other words, that he and his body being old was going to be able to produce a child again. Or not again. Bruce hadn't done that yet. Okay, I think it's rather fascinating. Then God says, okay, separate the animals. And he did. He separated the animals. Three-year-old heifer, three-year-old uh, ewe, and a three-year-old ram of the goats. How fascinating. And a, and a bird. He didn't split the bird. Split them all up, path of blood, and he sat there waiting. Because he had asked, by how am I going to know that this is going to happen? He says, I'll show you. He says, split the animals. Whoa! God was really getting into this covenant thing. He says, okay. So he cuts these animals in half. That makes things bloody in case you had ever figured that out. I don't know if any of you have ever done any slaughtering. That's a lot of blood. If you've ever done any shooting of animals out in the, the hills out there and had to gut one of them, huh? Hey, that's a lot of blood. Three of these animals, they're three years old. They're not tiny animals. He meticulously has to cut them in half and lay the, the halves out. Then he all day chases birds off of them. Sun goes down. Just as it's starting to come down, God zaps him, puts him in a trance and says, ha, ha, now pay attention. Well, that's a good way of doing it. You know? That's a good way of doing it. And then as the sun sets, he sees a smoking furnace. They knew what a furnace was. Just a, a cylindrical pot that they put fire in and they put different ways of it and it just got hot, but it smoked. The hotter you get, I mean, they just, they're hot. They're smoking. A smoking furnace and a burning torch lit. And one came from one direction and one came from the other direction and they came down through those animals. Abram didn't walk the path of blood. They did. And they came together. And in the center of that, God the Father, the smoking furnace of justice, met with his son, the lamp of the word. And they entered into covenant. Why was that important to Abraham? Because the covenant was not with him as much as it was with his seed. And you have got to start a seed somewhere. And he was proving that they had a covenant from the father and the son. And the son was going to end up being Abram's seed. And therefore the seed had to start somewhere. How will I know that I will have a child? He saw the father and son enter into a covenant that Jesus himself was going to come. Oh, that's deep. That's awesome. How would you like to witness that? That'll make a holy roller out of you. I don't think he believed in tongues, but I'm sure he did it. I'm just... That would get my attention. Because he understood it. We look at it and go, cute, nice. No. Deep, powerful of God. And it happened. That's just incredible. Then, then chapter 16 comes along. Trouble from one end to the other. And Sarai, Abram's wife, did not bear to him. 
And to her belonged a female slave, an Egyptian, and her name was Hagar. Now, I got to tell you about this. Abram was 75 when he left Haran. The Bible says. And he moved into the land of Canaan. He was 75. Now, the Bible says that he lived in the land of Canaan for 10 years. He was 75 then. He's 85 now. He's 85 years old. 85. Cool. Now, Abram believed God because of the covenant. Now, I don't know the time frame. It doesn't say the time frame between the last covenant and this covenant, between the splitting of the animals in chapter 15 and what's happening in chapter 16. But Abram believed God for his own body. He said, this body, this very body is going to produce a child. However, he did not believe for Sarai's body. There was a problem here. Sarai did not hear any of these conversations. She was not out with the smoking furnace and the, and the fire, fire torch. She wasn't in on all this. Abram was saying, this is going to come out of my body. This is going to come out of my body. Where's the emphasis? My body. He didn't have anything about understanding he should have because he had covenant with Sarai. God, being a covenant-making God, would have used Sarai. Wouldn't that make sense? It would make sense. Abram? Got a little brain burp going. Okay. Sarai gives Abram Hagar. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, did not bear to him, and to her belonged a female slave, an Egyptian. Her name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, See now, Jehovah has kept me from bearing. Go in now to my slave girl. Perhaps I may be built up from her, and Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Where is the problem here? The problem is he didn't check with the boss. Could Abram have said, gone out outside, grabbed a calf, grabbed something, thrown it on the altar? Don't you think? He had a few of them, more than he could count. Fill the land. Don't you think he could have approached God and said, Sarai has this, this proposal. What do you think? What do you think God would have said? No, he would have he would explained it. Explained it? He would have explained it better. Okay? Abraham should have caught it at the beginning. But he just listened to Sarai, just like so many of us just listened blatantly to the boss of the house and just right? Am I getting in trouble with anybody yet? <laughs> hey, listen, my family set me up this week. They did, they did. Conspiracies? <sighs> okay. He didn't even ask. He didn't even ask. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Now, it might have been involved that Abram looked at, at Hagar and went, okay. Good plan. <laughs> Slave girl? Egyptian? He may have been 85, but he wasn't dead. You understand what I'm saying? You know, he might have really liked this thing. And he has permission from his wife. And he needed a purity conference. Amen. That's what he needed. That's what I'm saying. But we got not into time travel. I can't go back and do that. That would be kind of good. But anyway... So Sarai, Abram's wife, took her slave girl, Hagar the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Now, this is kind of tricky. He married her. She is his wife. Did, does God really go behind multiple wives? Is that his plan? Was this God's plan? No, this was not God's plan. What was he trying to do? He was trying to take something that sounded good in the natural that satisfied his flesh and he tried to make it acceptable. He tried to make something acceptable that was going to turn out very bad. He's trying to make something bad look good by putting religious trappings around it and making it socially acceptable. Listen, I can say this, I'm not in England. Homosexuality is a sin. It is bad. Don't tell me you were born that way. Actually, men are conceived as girls. They really are. 
then brain damage happens. It's true. Chemical comes in, certain synapses in the brain, seared, <laughs> brain damage, and he's a male. Okay? My wife has been rubbing that in for years. And she says, and she even said, I even know where the part of the brain went. And I... So, the more you think about that, the worse it gets, okay? So you just let that ride. <laughs> Bring that up at the purity conference, that I'll tell you. So many comments come to mind that I cannot say right now. Do you understand? I'm really trying to filter here. I'm trying to be a nice guy. I have enough. I can't believe you said it's to last a lifetime. I don't need any more. Okay. We'll go on here. Okay. Homosexuality is a sin. Homosexuals are evil? No. Homosexuals are people that need to be loved and need to be delivered, need to be set free and need to be helped. But homosexuality, I don't care what trappings you put on it. I don't care how socially acceptable it's trying to become. Hey, you want to do something fun? Go on to any campus on the entire United States and stand up on a soapbox and say anything bad about Christianity and see how many people will stop you and call you a hate crime person. You can go anywhere. Christianity's stupid. It's, a, it's horrible. It's bad. And everybody's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stand up on that same soapbox and say homosexuality is wrong and see what happens. Stand up on that same soapbox and say feminism is wrong. Stand up on that soapbox and say men are stupid and nobody will bother you. You can male bash all you want. You can military bash all you want. You can Christian bash all you want and it's socially acceptable. But you better not say anything against women, against homosexuals. You better not. They're the darlings of the community. <laughs> now, my wife is my darling in my house. Hallelujah. And I think that's awesome. But that's me giving her honor. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But listen, I'm not into feminism. I'm not into homosexuality. Why? I've seen the damage. Should women get paid equal? Yes. Are women equal to men? No. I didn't say they're inferior or superior. They're just not equal. They're not the same. Praise God, there's a difference. <laughs> I love her dearly. Okay, where am I? Oops, we're right here. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took her slave girl, Hagar, gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan. And he went into Hagar, and, you know, science still works. What God has created to function still functions. And even when it's not God's design and done the wrong way, it still functions. And listen, I'll tell you something. This is important to know. If you have sex outside of marriage, there's a good chance of getting pregnant. I'm talking to the singles over on this side of the room because the rest of us are going, yeah, preach it, brother. Okay. Listen, you do things that God has designed and things work the way God designed them. Even if you don't do them God's way, God's function still functions. God invented gravity. Not his plan that you jump off the roof. I have jumped off several roofs. I have found, you thought that I had a lightning quick mind, but I didn't learn the first few. Still took that last one that really, really hurt. To make me understand, jumping off roofs is not a good idea. We were watching some guys yesterday, we were driving around, came out of Costco, and there's some guys up doing roofing on these um, apartment complexes. So they're two, three floors off the ground, and everybody's wearing a rope and harness. Why is that? Because we're all capable of taking that one more step than we need to take. Yeah. <laughs> and I've known people who have fallen off of roofs wearing those harnesses. And they are thanking God, mostly, that they had the harness. Mostly. That really hurts. You've got to know those harnesses. That really hurts. 
That's that sudden, sudden stop stuff, you know? Really mess with you. Gravity works everywhere. Whether it's God's intention for you to jump off that roof or not, gravity still functions. Productivity still functions. Okay? Abram got Hagar pregnant. Why? Abram was not, Abram was not shooting blanks. He was not the problem. Okay? Sarai was the problem. Her womb was closed. Okay. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived, and she saw that she had conceived, and her mistress was despised in her eyes. Now, this is, this is really, really crazy. He has sex with her, and she conceives. This was the plan. This was the plan from the beginning. I don't think they explained it to Hagar. She's a slave girl. Nobody explains things to her. So that she goes through, do this, do that, do this. Okay, now I'm his wife. Wham, now I'm pregnant. She goes, Wah. And then she started to hate Sarai. Look what you did. <laughs> hate Abraham. He's the one who did it. Think about it. Sarai didn't do anything. She just gave her over. But Hagar hated Sarai. Well, and then Sarai said to Abram, My injury be upon you. I gave my slave girl into your bosom. And she saw that she had conceived, and I was despised in her eyes. Let Jehovah judge between me and you. And so Abram says to Sarai, See, your slave girl's in your hand. Do with her what is good in your eyes. And Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from before her. This is dumb. Is she a wife or not? Well, because he didn't have a true, real covenant with her, even though he married her to make it look good, his covenant was with Sarai. He knew it. He had a relationship with her. And he says, oh, do whatever you want to. Abuse her. Do whatever you want. Doesn't matter to me. She's not under my protection. Do it. He released her. Whoa, that's deep. Then verse 7. She fled. And the, the angel of Jehovah found her by a well of water in the wilderness, by the well in the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's slave girl. Where'd you come from? Now, this is kind of fascinating. <coughs> Excuse me. What's wrong with what he said? He said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai. What are you doing here? What should he have said if we'd have done it the way we thought about it? He would have said, Hagar, wife of Abram, my covenant partner. What are you doing here? What does that tell me? His becoming her wife. His becoming her wife. Her becoming his wife, that just didn't sound right. That's what I said. I thought, something was wrong there. Was totally illegal. It was just a formality so he could have sex with her. God never saw her as Abraham's wife, or Abram's wife. He says, Sarai, Sarai, slave, what are you doing out here? <coughs> Where are you going? Now, I think it's funny, it's fascinating to me that God cared about Hagar. He really did. He found her running. He says, what are you, what are you doing out here? <laughs> Life is not really good at home. Now, who is this person she's talking to? This is Jesus, and I can prove it. I know it says angel of the Lord, but the word angel, both in Hebrew and Greek, just means messenger. Who is Jesus? He is the word, which means he is the message. He is the messenger. Now listen to this. The angel of Jehovah said to her, oh, verse 8, he said, Hagar, Sarai's slave girl, where'd you come from? And where do you go? Where are you heading? She says, I am fleeing from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of Jehovah said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. And the angel of Jehovah said to her, I, I, will exceedingly multiply your seed. Since when does an angel have that authority? Okay. Who is this? This is, this is Jesus. This is a, a manifestation of Jesus himself. And he says, I will exceedingly multiply your seed so that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of Jehovah said to her, Behold, you are with child and shall bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael, because Jehovah has attended to your affliction. Jim, what does Ishmael mean? God, very good. 
I love I love putting Jim on the spot. Isn't that fun? You guys can all do that anytime you want to. It's a national sport. You're welcome. God will hear. She says, oh, wow, you name Ishmael. Now, right now, that name is not a good name. I don't know very many people that name their kids Ishmael. Okay? That really has a bad connotation to it, but it really means heard of the Lord. This is pretty neat. Um, then he says, <laughs> I love this. Call his name Ishmael because Jehovah has attended to your affliction, and he shall be a wild ass of a man. Thank you so very much. Can't we bless him with something other than this? This is a blessing? Hello? I, I'm sure he's sitting there going, huh? Listen to this. It, it is horrible. And he should be a wild ass of a man. His hand against all and the hand of everyone against him. And he shall live before all his brothers. <laughs> oh, I got to say this. <laughs> she gave me that look. Did you know that they... <laughs> I figured this out yesterday. I figured this out. They have a plan on how to make an ass out of you. I'm not... Really, it's a plan. See, this is the... I can't believe you're shaking of the head over here. Because it says so on the box. What box? I get stuff and it says, assembly acquired. Required. (laughs) So they have figured out how to make an ass out of you and it's called assembly. And they're going to do it really easy because it says easy assembly on the box. So I figure it's a plan. They're out there to make a gorilla ass out of you. So anyway, anyway, he's a wild ass of a man, okay? And we'll get back to Ishmael now that I've made a complete fool of myself. My wife is going, my God, you aren't coming home this day. Okay. (laughs) Help, you better start praying for that woman. That's all I can tell you. Okay. Now, he's... This is a nasty, nasty prophecy that's being said here. But Hagar runs away. Angel finds her to send her back. And he prophesies over him. He'll be a wild donkey of a man. How nice. Thank you so very much. But she goes back. And she called on the name of Jehovah, the one speaking to her, you, a God of vision. And, and for she said, even here, I have looked after the one seeing me. On account of this, the well was called the well of the living one seeing me. Behold, is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore a son to Abram. And Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Now, I am only going to preach this first half of the message today. Because we need to understand something here. I don't want to miss this. I want you to listen real carefully. We are talking about having covenant with our Lord God and Him protecting us and Him loving us and Him taking us places. But listen, folks, I'm telling you, there's a danger here. The danger here is us making Ishmael's. I had a, a friend that wanted an a, a RV. He wanted a motorhome so bad. And he, well, he just kept hammering on it and hammering on it and hammering on it. And his wife was just about ready to kill him. He found this deal. All the wives go, oh, God, not a deal. <laughs> Lord, have mercy on those that find deals, you know. Huh? It was a really good deal for a while. And he was able to afford this motorhome, and he got it. Man, he was so happy. They took it for a ride around the block and a part fell off. He got in the driveway and it started leaking down his driveway. Oh, he got a deal. And he started soaking money into this deal. And pretty soon, it was sucking him dry. It was a money pit. So one day, he came in and he told his wife, I have a name for the motorhome. <laughs> she says, what's that? It is Ishmael. (laughs) Because I have waylaid the plan of God with my own flesh, and it has produced an offspring that is killing me. They now live in Hawaii. Something must have gone right. (laughs) Okay. It was always one of those stories, always amazed me. He said, I drove Ishmael for about a year, 
sold Ishmael, somebody got a good deal. <laughs> we are trying not to get an Ishmael lawnmower. We want to get one that is blessed. Folks, listen. Think about your life. Think about what God has told you is going to be true in your life. Most of you have had prophecies, words from God, things about what's going to happen. Now listen, you have got to be very, very careful. Because you can do the same thing Abram did. It's been a long time, and a long time, and a long time. When is this going to be fulfilled? A long time, and another long time, and an even longer time after that. Anybody here get tired of waiting for their vision to be fulfilled? Every hand in the room should be raised. We're all to that point. We're like, when are we going to see this thing happen? When are we going to see it happen? When are we going to see it happen? And we tend to want to fulfill it in our flesh. You must not. You must not. It will burn you down. It will hurt you bad. It will suck the life out of everything you thought was in the anointing. You've got to be careful. If it takes your flesh to fulfill this thing, it wasn't God. If you can do it by your flesh, would you want to? Well, that's easy to answer now, isn't it? Well, that's an easy answer. But you think about it. You, 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 sometimes it looks good. If we just, oh, if we just did this and did this, and then we could kind of just, just finagle this and look at that, and then God's vision fulfilled. I wish I could say Abram got it, but he didn't get it. He doesn't get it until the next chapter. He doesn't get it till the next chapter, and I can give you part of that tonight, uh, this morning. When he says, chapter 17, verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, wait a minute, he's 86 when Ishmael was born. 13 years more than when he tried to fulfill it in the flesh. Jehovah appeared to Abram and said to him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. And I'm not going to get into that because I'm going to get into that next week. That's, there's a lot of stuff right there. Okay? And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God spoke with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant was with you and you shall be the father of many nations. And he changes his name. Okay, I will not get into all that because we're going to do that next week. And I will establish this uh, and I will give it to your seed and your seed after you for the supporting. And God said to Abram, You shall keep my covenant. And he, he starts talking about all this sort of stuff. I'm trying to find it here. That's exactly where I am. God said to Abram, verse 15, You shall not call your wife Sarai. You shall call her Sarah. I have blessed her and have also given to you a son from her. Yea, I have blessed her. And she shall become nations, kings of people. And Abram fell on his face and laughed. And he said in his heart, Shall one be born to a son of a hundred years? What's 13 years difference? He was really easy to use it 13 years ago. No way. And shall Sarai bear a daughter of nine, being a daughter of 90 years? And Abram said to God, All that Ishmael may live before you. And he was still trying to justify his Hagar Ishmael experience before God. And he's not listening to what God is saying. He's saying, hey, may Ishmael walk before you. And, and God said, shut up. Okay. God said, your wife truly shall bear you a son. She calls his name Isaac and all this. And he says, as to Ishmael, verse 20, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall be the father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation of wild donkeys. Yeah, he says, I'll make him a great nation. And he did. Ishmael himself personally had 12 kids, 12 sons. He said, that sounds familiar. 12. Why is God doing it? He made 12 later. Okay? All this, but he had to do it through his way of making covenant, not, not somebody else's way. Who ended up being the sons of Ishmael? Folks, we have conflict in the Middle East today because of that very issue. The entire Arab nations are all from Ishmael, and they are proud of it. 
and they will tell you we are sons of Abraham. And they are. But they're not sons of the covenant. They can become sons of the covenant in a very sneaky way. It has nothing to do with being Arab or Israeli. It has to do with becoming a Christian. And one can, can become a Christian, and what do they do? They become a son of the covenant, just as much as Isaac. They come into the family that Isaac births. You can change somebody's whole nationality. Because they changed mine. I was Swedish. I'm no longer Swedish. Even though, hurdy birthy, mark, mark, you know. The Swedish chef, my hero. Anyway. Yeah, me too. I always have. Nobody can understand him, but I love him. Sounds a lot like my grandfather did. He heard me. He knows And uh, <laughs> I saw my grandfather one day. They had Mexican migrant workers come through every year to help. And my grandfather, very set on his ways, very Swedish, never got the knack of English very well. And his accent was so thick, I never did understand him. Okay? And... So he's trying to explain to the boss of the migrant workers what he wanted done, who had a very thick Mexican accent and couldn't speak English very well. So here's these two guys, nose to nose. They're both not very tall. But they were nose to nose in the yard, and Grandpa was trying to explain to him what he wanted done. And this migrant worker was explaining to him how come it couldn't be done that way. And Grandpa says, no, you're going to do it this way. He says, no, we're going to do it this way. And they're trying to explain it back and forth. <laughs> now I'm standing in the house at my, my cousin's house. I'm sitting there watching out the window and I'm watching this stuff and Grandpa's getting frustrated and he's starting to use his authority and this migrant worker is trying to fight for his people thing and it started getting heated and more heated and the madder they got, the worse their English got and the less communication happened and pretty soon they were nose to nose yelling full-blooded Swedish and Spanish just going after it. Man, it was almost coming to blows. It was, but it was just Swedish and Spanish. Nobody was really communicating, but everybody was communicating to the best of their ability. And I said, "Wait, I'm laughing." My dad walks up to me, puts his arm around my shoulder, and says, "I know that's funny, but when Grandpa walks in the door, you better be laughing at something else." <laughs> I learned a valuable lesson that day. Boy, there was some stuff on TV that was hilarious in about two or three minutes after that. But we're sitting, ha, ha, laughing at this thing, just like it was the stupidest stuff you've ever seen in your life. But I don't even remember what it was, but hallelujah, we were laughing at something else when he came in. He was not in the mood. <coughs> Folks, listen, you can, you can waylay the true plan of God in your life by trying to get it done in the flesh. You can waylay the true plan of God. Now listen, God's plan is for you to be blessed, isn't it? God's plan is for you to be prospering, isn't it? It is God's plan for you to be healed from your pain, delivered from your bondage, set free and living a life of joy and glory. That is God's plan. How are you going to get there? Can you do that in the flesh? The Bible says, starting in the spirit, are you now going to fulfill the thing by the flesh? No. I have to trust that God is doing something. Meaning what? Occupy till I come. I do stuff until God brings it to plan, brings mind. I don't try to produce or make it happen. I never, ever, ever planned to become an expert on sexual deviancy. I didn't. God said, I want to use you and stuff. Cool. Then it started coming up. I said, fine. I said, Lord, when I got set free from the porn, I wanted to know how to get others set free from the porn. That was important to me. I didn't know what I was getting into. I did not know what I was getting into. My wife, bless her self, her little self there, helped me get it together to write it down. I want it in a book. She helped me see that. That was not my plan. I never thought I could ever be a published author. Okay? Never, never even occurred to me. That was something that, that came out through time. And as that came out, we did it in Russia. Okay, I got a book. Cool. What does that mean? Nothing. I got into Greeley. I didn't even have the book published yet. And then I started talking about how, you know, I, I would like to minister this. And I wanted to minister it one time to my church. And that's it. it. 
just, it blew up on me. I didn't plan on doing these purity conferences, but I know now it's God's plan. And I know now, I mean, it took me a while to figure out that God had something bigger going with every one of these. It wasn't because I was trying to produce it in the flesh. It was because God had planned it from the beginning. Okay? I have tried to grow churches. Guess how well that works? It doesn't. God said, it is my church. I will grow it. That's it, the name of that tune. I've tried growing churches. I can't grow a church. I cannot. I've tried healing people. I haven't healed anybody yet. You understand? Man, I'm totally dependent on God to do it. I've tried to do all sorts of wonderful things. And guess what? It's blown up in my face. I've tried everything I can think of to do to do evangelism. I have tried evangelism from every point in perspective, from street preaching to going door to door to knocking people down to having concerts in the field to in the parking lot to done everything I can think of to do to do evangelism. And the Lord says, when I do evangelism through you, it'll get done. I can't do what God isn't doing. Okay? I don't want to make an Ishmael. This church is not to be an Ishmael. This church is to be an Isaac. It is to be born of covenant, done the, the best way that God knows how to do it. I can't make it any different. Can I change me? No, I can't even do that. Can God change me? Yes. Does that mean you guys need to be praying more? Hallelujah. Okay? Am I perfect? No. Am I better than I was last year? Yes. Actually, out of the stuff I was getting this last week, I'm better than I was last Sunday by quite a bit. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Things are changing in my life. I know that. How about you? How's things going? Are you where God called you to be? Are you doing what God called you to do? Are you trying to fulfill it in your own flesh? That's a good question. Because we always hear this, are you where God called you to be? Are you doing what God called you to do? Wait. That sounds, and that tends to be twisted into, well, you better get to work then. Okay, and wait a minute. Yeah, you better do what God tells you to do, when He's telling you to do it, and how He's telling you to do it. The when, the how, the, and the, the timing is everything. You know the difference between Logos and Rhema? Do you know the difference between the Kairos and the Kronos? The Kronos is all time, just like Logos is all the word. Kairos is specific time, just like Rhema is a specific word. You can do your Rhema in the Kronos and screw it all up. But if you have, and you can have the, the Kairos and not have the Rhema and try to do the Logos in the Kairos, and it won't work. What are you going to need? You need the rhema at the kairos. And when it comes together, critical mass happens. Things work. Boy, please listen. If there's anything, anything that the Lord has been showing us over the years, over the years, is timing is everything. Timing is everything. Just can you wait? Can you relax? I've been waiting for 25 years! Finally, maybe, when you have finally got your hands off of it, God can fulfill it! You want to go around a mountain one more time? No. Mount Sinai is a lot taller now because now I'm walking in a trench. <laughs> Mercy day. Been around that mountain so many times. Do not have an Ishmael. You don't need it. Abram has a son and an heir. Well, now he has a son that is not an heir. Okay? Pretty wild. God had nothing to do with the Ishmael thing. You know what God did do? He kept redeeming the mistake and redeeming the mistake and redeeming the mistake. He prophesied over him. He blessed him. He did all sorts of stuff. You know, he didn't have to. He did that for Abram's sake. God, do we have a relationship with our Father the way we need it? Are we understanding our covenant with God? Aren't you glad I didn't preach the other half of this thing? <laughs> Amazing. Are you blessed? Are you blessed? Here's the thing. Everything is suspect. I have to get that way in my life on a regular basis where I say everything is suspect. Did I hear or did I not hear? I have to give up things on a regular basis just giving back to the Lord's hands. 
And he says, no, that one's, this is me, this one's me, this one's me. I go, I gave him five things, I got three back. Hmm. What about this one and this one? Nope. Those weren't me. Oh! Can anybody here in this room miss it? Has anybody in this room ever missed it? Is there any condemnation to those who miss it? Only in your own heart. Folks, just let it go. You miss it, fine. Bring it to the Lord, then go on. Bring it to the Lord and go on. <laughs> I'm not going to condemn you for missing it because I've been there. You guys come in and say, I've been to three or four. Be in bondage. Folks, let's get rid of the religion behind the thing. We try to make them look religious to make it look and justify our actions to doing something. Everything is suspect. Put it all back in the hands of the Lord and let him show you what's in Ishmael. We don't need it. We don't need it. Does that make sense this morning? You glad you came to this part? <laughs> oh, boy. Well, at least I'm all set up for next Sunday. And I got a period conference this week, so that's a good thing. I don't have to do much. <laughs> next week ought to be good. Next week is going to be good. I'm, I'm more, more just about right next door to ready. So, fine-tuning. Well, let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, this morning. Lord, you are doing a mighty work among us. Lord, I don't want to waylay any part of it by making it an Ishmael that we do in the flesh. Lord, I don't want to confront people that's not at the right time. Lord, I don't want to force something to happen that's not there yet. Lord, I just want to listen to you, be at peace, and see you work. Lord, I pray for the people here. I pray for each one of us, Lord. Lord, we all have scars of the Ishmael in our life. We all have things that was not of you. And Lord, don't let us flesh these. Talk to us, Lord. Show us these things. The Lord just says, I am talking. Okay. Lord, open our ears to hear you so we will know. Lord, talk to us so blatantly and open, Lord, that it's, it's like, a, like a sign right in front of our eyes blinking. Don't do this. It's an Ishmael. Lord, help us. See it. Help us. Turn things into your hands so we can have your joy. The only thing we need to worry about today is today. And for that, we'll give you praise. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Go with God, you're blessed.